Chapter 2 Sleeping Pills When Wilbur's eyes flew open, he could still smell the salt in the air. The clock on his nightstand read 8.44, meaning that Wilbur hadn't woken up at the crack of dawn for no reason again. That was a relief. Hopefully, his sleep schedule would go back to normal now. The dream lingered in his mind as he waited for his coffee to brew, watching the birds flit about from tree branch to tree branch outside his window. It was strange, because while it was easy to brush the dream off as him still struggling with the fact that he found a dead body, and his mind manifesting that stress in weird ways, something still felt off to him about the whole thing. Like the kid's voice. He had a very distinct voice that Wilbur could imagine perfectly, despite the fact that Wilbur had never even met the kid before. The boy had insisted he wasn't dead. That was impossible because Wilbur had literally seen his corpse. All the police had seen his corpse. He was dead, and there was no getting around that. It was all because of that stupid fucking forest. He was sure of it. The trees had eyes and they had been watching Wilbur on the beach that morning. Just standing near that place always unsettled him, and rehashing all the old myths about it with Quackity certainly hadn't helped matters. The paranoia he had about the forest had crept into his sleeping mind. As much as he wished he could say he was an adult and was no longer freaked out by children's scary stories, he couldn't ignore the fact that stories had to come from somewhere. Every myth had an origin, Something to inspire its creation? Wilbur didn't know what inspired all of those horrific tales of the forest, and that's what scared him the most about it. He wished he'd never gone to the beach yesterday morning. If he had just stayed in his apartment and watched the sunrise from his bedroom window, someone else would have found the body. Someone else would be haunted by those washed-out blue eyes. It wouldn't be his problem. But unfortunately... He couldn't go back and change the past. So he waited for his coffee to brew and tried to do anything to keep his mind from focusing on the way it felt to have the boy's hands grip his arms. A few hours later, Wilbur found himself back at the diner. Although it was less intense than yesterday, the dead body was still the talk of the town. The police still hadn't released any information on the kid and Wilbur wondered if they were going to post a description of him to see if anyone could identify him. Still, it was a small town. If no one on the police force could identify him, then it was unlikely anyone else in the town would be able to either. As Wilbur passed another order through the window to the cook, the door chimed with a new customer, and Wilbur's eyes widened when he spotted a familiar head of pink hair walking through the door. Techno was dressed casually today, with a button-up and jeans that had become his standard uniform for his detective work. His bright pink hair was pulled back in a low bun at the nape of his neck, and although he didn't smile when Wilbur met his eyes, Wilbur could read his uncle well enough to see the warmth flash through his gaze all the same. Hey, Techno. Wilbur greeted as Techno sat down at the breakfast bar, the same spot Quackity had been at the day before. You want your usual? Yeah, that'd be great. Techno grunted, stretching his arms above his head and letting the joints pop loudly. Nodding, Wilbur scribbled down Techno's usual order and passed it back to the cook. Then he grabbed a mug and a tea bag, filled it up with hot water and set it off to the side to let it brew. How are you doing? Wilbur asked once that was done. Techno, who had been dragging his hands down his face, blinked a few times at Wilbur. I'm exhausted. It's a mess down at the station right now. Because of the... yeah, that. Techno nodded, blinking a few times. Puffy told me you were the one who called it in yesterday. Pressing his lips together, Wilbur nodded. Uh, yeah, I was. You doing alright after that? Techno asked, raising an eyebrow at him. Wilbur looked away and shrugged. I mean, it definitely wasn't the ideal way to spend my morning. Techno frowned. Wilbur, come on. Damn it. Was Wilbur really just that easy to read? Fine, you want me to say it fucked me up? Well, yeah, it fucked me up. Wilbur huffed, 
folding his arms over his chest. Every time I close my eyes, I see him. It's not fun. Glancing down, Wilbur noticed the tea had sufficiently darkened and took the tea bag out before passing it over to Techno. It'll get better after a few days. Techno reassured him, muttering a thanks as he took a sip of the tea. The first time I saw a body, I threw up. Wilbur snorted, although there was no amusement in the sound. So did I. Techno winced in sympathy. You should go visit your dad. Take your mind off things. I'm sure he'd be happy to see you. Barely fighting back the urge to roll his eyes, Wilbur turned to grab an order from the cook and placed it onto a tray before hoisting it up in the air. Sure, I'll pop over to Phil's place and be like, Hey, Dad, I know we haven't talked in weeks, but guess what? I found a dead body. How have you been? He didn't bother to wait for Techno's response as he walked out from behind the counter to deliver the food. As he set the plates down in front of a few teenagers crowded into a booth, he could feel Techno's eyes boring into the back of his head. Picking up the tray, Wilbur pointedly ignored Techno's gaze as he moved back behind the counter. Keeping his eyes down, he began to rinse a random cup out, silently praying the cook would call out another order soon. I still don't understand why you avoid talking to Phil, Techno said, clearly not wanting to let the topic be. I don't avoid him, Wilbur shot back, wetting a rag to wipe down the counter, despite the fact that it was already clean. I'm just busy, you know. Oh, really? Doing what? Techno challenged. Shit. What could he say? Hanging out with friends? Techno hummed. Like who? Quackity's words from the day before echoed in his mind. I never see you out anywhere, and the few times I do, you're always by yourself. I see Quackity sometimes. He lied. Again, there was that hum. The one that Techno made when he knew Wilbur was lying, but was going to watch him dig himself into a hole until he gave up and came clean. And as always, Wilbur kept digging. It was easier. Easier to dig and dig until his lungs were filled with so much dirt he had to cuff the truth out, along with the rocks and earth. So you're hanging out with Quackity so much you can't even give Phil a call? Running the rag under the water again, Wilbur winced when it came out far too hot, turning the skin of his palm bright red. It wasn't that he didn't like his dad. Phil had done the best he could, raising Wilbur on his own in the wake of his mother's death. He was never a bad parent. He never yelled, never was cold, always made sure Wilbur knew he could come to him if he needed anything. But there had always been a barrier there. Some invisible wall that Phil had hidden himself behind when they buried his mother in the cemetery down the road. When the worms and bugs had claimed her as one of their own, Wilbur wondered if his father ever felt like he was down there with her as well. Buried under the dirt, being eaten away day by day until he was nothing but a skeleton. Maybe that's why it was easier for Wilbur to let his own lungs fill with dirt rather than state the truth. Maybe he and Phil were both meant to reside in the earth. A family of three sharing one coffin. It would certainly be the closest Wilbur had been to his father in years. It was unfair of Wilbur to describe Phil in such cruel terms. He knew his father was mourning, and he shouldn't fault him for that. Wilbur would have mourned her in the same way if he actually remembered her. But he had been so young when she died, she was nothing more than a ghost on the wall in their home. Sometimes he thought he could hear her laughter in the wind, but he could never trust the trees in this town, especially not the whispers he heard from their leaves. Like I said, I'm busy. Wilbur snapped to Techno, ignoring the way his palm now throbbed from the burn. And then, in blessed timing, the cook called out another order, and Wilbur breathed a sigh of relief when he saw it was Techno's. Picking up the steaming plate of hash browns and eggs, he gave it a once-over to make sure the cook made the hash browns extra crispy, and then set the plate down in front of his uncle. If you don't want to see Phil, I won't push you, Techno said, pulling the plate closer to him. 
but you do need to talk to him at some point. At least so he's not worrying over you all the time. Wilbur pauses, his wipe down of the sink. He doesn't worry about me that much. He knows I can handle myself. Huffing, Techno dropped his fork onto his plate with a loud clatter. Of course he knows you can handle yourself, but he's your dad. I know he's not the best with all that emotional stuff, same as me, but parents worry about their kids. You should be glad I didn't tell him you were the one who called in the body, or else your phone would have been ringing off the hook. Since when did you become an expert on parenting? Wilbur questioned, raising an eyebrow at him. At this, Techno snorted. I mean, I've watched Phil do it for years. Plus, I babysat you plenty and you didn't die, so I'd like to think I'm not completely useless. When I was ten, you tried to teach me how to sword fight with real swords. Wilbur deadpanned. You didn't lose any limbs or eyes, and now you know how to use a sword, so who's the real winner here? Despite his piss-poor mood, Wilbur couldn't help but laugh at that. I've never seen Phil look more scared shitless than when he walked in the door and saw us going at it, Wilbur said, smiling at the memory. And then I got lectured for the next hour while you played Mario Kart in your room. Techno finished, matching his smile. That had been a good day, one that Wilbur hadn't thought about for a long time. The laughter died down. Maybe I'll call him tonight, Wilbur said. The dirt tasted bitter on his tongue. I hope you do, Techno responded. Techno could see the earth falling from his lips. Techno could always see it. This time, though, he didn't call Wilbur out on it. Wilbur wasn't sure if he was relieved by this or not. Wilbur wanted to go to the forest. It was a strange sensation, one he wasn't familiar with because normally he did his best to stay as far away from the forest as possible. But as he drove home from work, his conversation with Techno still heavy on his mind, something in his chest ached to face eyes that had been lingering on him since he left the beach. Maybe he was just sick of it. Maybe he was sick of the fear Maybe the only way to get the eyes to stop looking at him was to meet their gazes head-on. In the end, though, Wilbur found himself sitting on sand instead of earth. The sky was a pale shade of orange as dusk reared its head. Despite the tugging in his chest telling him to go into the forest itself, to let the dirt and moss grow over his skin and become one with the towering trees... There was something else in his head, screaming at him to do the exact opposite, warning him that if he walked into the forest, he might never come out. Wilbur had never been a good gambler, so he preferred to not take chances if he could avoid it. That's how he found himself on the beach instead, which was the last place he wanted to be. It looked the same as it had in his dream the night before. The water reached for his boots just like it had the day before. But Wilbur no longer saw this as a fun, teasing move from the icy gray water. Now, it felt like a silent threat. Yesterday had shown him what exactly could be lurking in that water. The longer he stared at the shimmering reflections bouncing off the waves, the more he wondered if there were other bodies hidden beneath them. More boys with blonde hair and washed-out eyes boys with pale skin and seaweed in their hair, who would reach out for Wilbur with freezing hands and drag him down, 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 down to the very bottom until he became just like the rest of them, his skin losing its color, his eyes blank and unseeing. Wilbur didn't know why he was back here. Wilbur didn't know why he hadn't left already. The smoke from his cigarette gently burned the back of his throat, it wasn't as soothing as it usually was, but Wilbur had already lit it, so he was going to pretend like it was helping. As he watched the sky grow darker and darker with each passing minute, smoke curling from his lips and around his face, Wilbur felt a buzz from the phone in his pocket. Taking it out, he saw he'd just gotten an email from some random website about a sale going on, and went to put his phone away, but paused. This was a beautiful view, 
Since he already had his phone out, why not get a picture? Pulling up his camera, Wilbur snapped a few pictures of the dark water bathed in the soft light of the dying sun. Of course, the pictures never turned out as good as the real thing in front of him, but there was always some sort of small fulfillment that came with attempting to freeze a moment like that in time, even if it was just a pale imitation of the real thing. After taking a few pictures, Wilbur went to his photo library to look over them. It was then that he noticed a few older pictures in his camera roll that made him pause. Wilbur had never been one for taking a ton of pictures of himself, unless he was with other people. He wasn't the biggest fan of social media, so he didn't see much point in taking pictures of himself if they were just going to sit in his camera roll taking up storage. But there were some pictures of himself sitting in his library that he struggled to remember taking. One was him sitting in his car, grinning, and holding up what he guessed was a milkshake from the diner he worked at. Another one was of him sitting in... a place he couldn't remember. The background was too dark to make out much detail, save for some kind of sheet of metal behind him. Then there was another of him working behind the counter at the diner, curls sticking up all over the place and coffee staining his apron. These photos were strange for several reasons. One was that in all of them, there was some sort of empty space next to Wilbur. Like in the car one, the phone was angled so you could see both Wilbur and the passenger seat of his car. The unknown place, again, had a lot of negative space to his left side. And the diner one didn't even seem like he could have been the one who took it, because both of his hands were visible in the picture. It was like there was supposed to be someone next to him in all these photos, but they had just been erased. He stared at the empty spaces, and that foggy feeling he'd had at the beach the day before came back full force. There was a throbbing behind his eyes, and the longer he stared at the pictures, the worse it got. Something was wrong. Something... what was wrong? When the pounding in his head became too painful to ignore... Wilbur shoved his phone in his pocket and took another eager drag of his cigarette. As soon as the pictures weren't in his line of sight, the throbbing faded. The photos weren't that weird. Just seemed like he was shitty at taking pictures of himself, which made sense, since he didn't have a lot of practice at it. There was a nagging in the back of his head, telling him he shouldn't brush this off. But the more he tried to focus on that nagging, the quicker it slipped away like sand falling through his fingers. The sand on the beach was cold against his free hand. For some reason, that also felt wrong. Wilbur didn't remember driving home. One moment he was at the beach, the cigarette burning the edges of his fingers. The next moment, he was on his couch with sand in his boots. Vaguely, he could recall getting into his car and heading back but that same foggy feeling hung over his mind the more he tried to think about it. So he decided not to worry about it too much. It had to just be the stress of the past two days. Stress could cause you to zone out, right? He was pretty sure that was a thing. Slumped against the cushions, staring at the dark screen of his TV, Wilbur wondered why his couch suddenly felt far too big for him. It wasn't like it was a large couch or anything. If Wilbur stretched across it, his feet would still hang off the other arm of it. But just like how his apartment had felt too quiet the night before, now his couch felt too big. Like he needed something else to fill the empty space next to him. Guess he really should start looking into animal shelters for that cat. Suddenly, a harsh ringing rang out from his pocket, and Wilbur jumped when he realized he'd turned his phone off silent. As he took out his phone, he silently pleaded that it wasn't his father calling him again. That Techno hadn't told Phil to contact Wilbur after their talk today in the diner. It must have been Wilbur's lucky day, because it wasn't Phil calling him. Wilbur grinned when he read the contact name. All of his worries immediately being brushed away as he hit the answer button. Nikki! Wilbur greeted cheerfully, falling back against the arms of the couch. Hi, Will, Nikki replied, 
her smile audible even through the phone speaker. It's so good to hear your voice. Nikki was one of the few people Wilbur knew that wasn't from his hometown. The two of them had met in an internet chat room when they were both young teenagers, and ended up staying in contact as they grew up. Nikki only lived a few hours north of his town, and after he'd graduated high school, he'd gone up to visit her for a whole week. Since then, they'd both gotten busy with adult life, but they still tried to call and catch up semi-regularly. It's good to hear yours, too. It's been way too long since we last talked, Wilbur said, grinning as he kicked his shoes off to put his feet up on the couch. It really has. Sorry I kind of disappeared. The bakery has gotten super busy lately. Nikki told him, sounding apologetic. No, don't be sorry at all. That's great that business is going well for you. Wilbur reassured her. How have things been with Tubbo? Tubbo was Nikki's younger brother who she took care of. Wilbur had only talked to him once during his visit up there, but he had been fun to talk to all the same. He's been good. School has been busy for him, so he's been a bit stressed. But a friend of his has been coming over a lot, and they do homework together, so he's keeping up with things pretty well. Nikki told him, and Wilbur could hear the pride in her voice when she talked about her brother. That's good. Wilbur nodded, blinking a few times. High school sucks ass. Nikki snorted. It really does, she said, and there was a moment of silence as he heard her shuffle around on the other end of the phone. What about you, though? Anything new? Oh yeah, things have been normal. Found a dead body at the beach, though, and now the dead kid is haunting my dreams. Bit inconvenient, you know. Wilbur wasn't going to say that. Nikki didn't need to know about the weird shit going on in his life right now. Because if he told her that, she would just start to worry about him. And she had enough things going on in her own life that Wilbur didn't want her wasting any energy on him. Eh, it's fine. Same thing as usual. He said, hoping Nikki couldn't hear the tightness in his voice. Nothing new at all? Nikki asked. And he could practically imagine the way she always pursed her lips when she was scrutinizing him. What about that new friend you told me about the last time we talked? Huh? There was a beat of silence as Wilbur tried to think of who Nikki could be talking about. New friend? The only people he would really even call his friends right now were Quackity and Nikki, and Quackity was anything but a new friend. He racked his brain, trying to think if there was anyone new he'd talked to in the past few months. Sure, there were a few regulars in the diner here and there that he'd chat with, but he wouldn't call them friends. There was a fuzziness in his head again, steering his thoughts away from the topic, as he resigned himself to accepting that he just had no clue who Nikki was talking about. Which new friend are we talking about here? Wilbur asked, hoping he didn't sound completely lost. I mean, I can't remember his name, but you mentioned a little while ago that you'd started hanging out with someone new. Nikki explained. That wasn't right. Quackity had said it himself. Wilbur was a loner. He couldn't think of a single person he'd hung out with in the past few months that wasn't someone he'd known for years. Sorry, Nikki. I have no clue who that could be. Wilbur said, shrugging to himself. I don't exactly get out a lot, so I wouldn't say making new friends is normal for me. My bad. I guess I got you mixed up with someone else. Nikki murmured, sounding disappointed. If you're not doing much, then, you should try to come up here sometime for a visit. The change in subject lifted the fog in his mind immediately. Please, I'd love to come up there. Hell, I'd move up there if I could. I fucking hate this town. Nikki giggled, familiar with this rant of his. You've mentioned that a few times, she teased. Though, if I'm being honest, you could move up here if you wanted to. The slow smile that had begun growing on his face again quickly slipped away. You know I can't do that, Nikki. But you could. It's not like you absolutely love your job there. And you just told me you don't even have that many friends. Come on, you'd love it up here, Will. Nikki pleaded. Sighing, Wilbur pinched the bridge of his nose. 
Trust me, I would if I could. But it's just... Well, you know how things are with my dad, and I just... I can't leave him, you know? There was a soft exhale on the other side of the phone. When was the last time you even saw your dad, Will? Nikki asked quietly. Damn it. One of the downsides of having met Nikki over the internet initially was that Wilbur had been more honest with her about his family than anyone else he'd ever met. The anonymity of the internet made confessions like that feel... safer. And with Nikki's gentle words and kind voice, it was almost impossible not to want to spill all of your secrets to her. Well, I might not visit my dad that often, but it'd be even worse if I moved away. Wilbur tried to reason with her. I know you feel like you need to stay close to him because you think he'd be too lonely without you, but you hardly see him as it is. Besides, he has techno, doesn't he? That was true. Techno and Phil saw each other nearly every day. I don't know, it just feels weird to think of leaving. Wilbur admitted, dragging a hand down his face. Nikki hummed in sympathy. I get it. But you should at least consider it. I appreciate it, Nikki. I'll let you know. Wilbur said, although he knew himself well enough to know that he was going to shove the offer out of his mind the second he hung up. Faintly, Wilbur heard a boy's voice shout something on Nikki's end of the call. Wait, you blew up a- Shit, Wilbur, I'm sorry, but I gotta go. Wilbur chuckled, having heard plenty stories about Tubbo's talent for blowing things up. Hope he didn't make too much of a mess this time. Nikki huffed. If he did, he's cleaning it up, not me. Good luck, Nikki. Bye, Wilbur. And with that, she hung up, leaving Wilbur in the stifling silence of his apartment once more. It was strange. Talking to Nikki had made things feel more normal than they had in the past two days. Despite the emptiness in his apartment still threatening to choke him, for a few brief minutes, he had managed to get rid of the feeling of being watched. That had all come back now, though. The hair rose on the back of his neck, and Wilbur sighed as he got up to make himself dinner. Keep himself busy. Keep himself distracted. It was better than letting himself drown in the quiet. After another uneventful night of TV watching and eating leftover pasta, Wilbur found himself staring at his bed with a choice sitting in front of him. He could try to sleep like normal. His eyes were heavy. If he managed to keep himself from thinking about the dream he had the night before, it shouldn't be that much of a problem to fall asleep. But that was the tricky part. As he sat down on his comforter, he couldn't help but think of that dream again. The boy's washed-out eyes and his warm hands grabbing Wilbur's arms. What if he dreamt of him again? What would he say this time? Anxiety crept up Wilbur's throat like claws. Without giving himself a chance to talk himself out of it, he reached for the anxiety pills his doctor had prescribed him a while back, for the nights when his head was far too busy to let him sleep. They were sedatives, which meant that they not only calmed him down, but knocked him out pretty quickly if he took a whole pill instead of a half a pill. Wilbur popped the whole pill in his mouth and washed it down with a swig of water from a mug. That night, he didn't dream. The next day, Wilbur woke up with a pounding headache and a weight pulling down his eyes that took two cups of coffee to get rid of. Side effects of knocking himself out with his medication, but worth it for a full night's rest nonetheless. Throughout the day, though, the fog from the medicine lingered in his mind. It weighed down his shoulders and found himself struggling to focus on grabbing orders at work. Thankfully, it was a slow day, and neither Techno nor Quackity showed up to chat with him. Gossip was passed around like it always was, though Wilbur only paid attention when he heard someone mention the boy at the beach. He still had yet to be identified. Wilbur didn't go to the beach that day, despite feeling the same tugging in his chest as the day before. Despite the strange urge to go there, he shouldn't. It would just upset him, and he needed to try and get over the dead body incident. In fact, he passed through the entire thing in a haze. 
going through the motions, but not really there. At least, not completely. After work, Wilbur dropped his keys under his car seat. When he climbed into the back seat so he could reach under and grab them, he noticed a red sweatshirt shoved under the passenger seat. The fog got heavier when Wilbur looked the sweatshirt over. He didn't recognize it, but it looked like it could be one of his. And when he sniffed it, he noticed it smelled like his laundry detergent. Must have been an old one he forgot about. Nikki didn't call that night. Wilbur didn't call her. He didn't call anyone. His only company was the voices coming from his TV and the eyes that were still boring into the back of his head. At this point, he was wondering if he was haunted. There were no strange noises in the apartment, and nothing was being moved around, but if there was a ghost in there, he ought to start charging them rent. That night, he took another sleeping pill. Once again, there were no dreams. The next day, Wilbur got a call from Phil. It was right when he was leaving his shift at the diner, mentally preparing himself to spend another evening in the silence that was quickly becoming unbearable. He just had to keep ignoring it, and it would eventually go away. But it was getting harder and harder to believe in that mantra, the more it proved futile. So maybe that was why Wilbur decided to answer the phone, when he saw Phil's contact name blaring across the screen. And maybe that's why when Phil asked if he wanted to come over for dinner, Wilbur found his mouth forming the word yes, without a second of hesitation. He was getting desperate to stay out of his apartment, to say the least. Wilbur didn't bother to go home at all. Instead, after he hung up on Phil, he turned on his blinker, knowing exactly how to get to his father's house from where he currently was. His current apartment wasn't all that far from his father's home. All it took was a few left turns to get himself away from the center of town and closer to the edges. It wasn't that Phil lived on the outskirts or anything, but if Wilbur still lived in his childhood home, it'd take him roughly an extra ten minutes to get to the diner. The fog in his mind had cleared up a bit compared to the day before, but he still felt off in a way he couldn't explain as he pulled into the driveway of Phil's house. Something that once could have been nostalgia curled in his chest when he saw the peeling white paint and weather-beaten porch lit up by the headlights of his car. In a way, staring at his childhood home reminded Wilbur of staring at a piece of rotten fruit. You knew what it was supposed to look like, but time had degraded it into something that was damaged and wrong in the tiniest of ways. The dark bruises almost invisible in certain lighting— but it only took the slightest touch to realize the inside was nothing like it had once been. Getting out of his car, wind whipped at his curls, carrying with it the smell of salt and brine. His fingers twitched for the cigarettes in his pocket, but he resisted the urge to grab one out and smoke it before going inside. Phil always hated the fact that he smoked. He didn't need a lecture because Phil smelled it on his breath. The porch steps creaked as he walked to the front door. He stared at the two chairs settled comfortably next to the door, the dark green cushions covered in a layer of dead leaves and dirt blown over from the last storm. It was obvious Phil didn't sit out here much anymore. His fingers wrapped against the thin wood. There was some shuffling inside, and Wilbur heard a muffled, One second. Soon, the door swung open, revealing a harried-looking Phil. It had been nearly a month since Wilbur last saw his father. He didn't look any different. Not that he ever really did. Hair the color of straw and eyes the color of ice stared out from a thin face. The kind of face you would struggle to put an age on if you'd never met Phil before. His jaw was covered in a thin layer of blonde stubble, and Wilbur wondered if his father did that on purpose, considering he almost never saw Phil completely clean-shaven. When Phil's eyes met Wilbur's through the black mesh of the screen door, they widened. Will, you didn't need to knock, he said, opening the screen door and gesturing for him to come inside. Wilbur shrugged. I don't know, it just felt weird to barge in unannounced. Mate, you've literally lived here most of your life. It's your home too, Phil told him, giving him a thin-lipped smile. 
swallowing down a comment about how it wasn't his home anymore. Wilbur stepped into the house and nodded. Fair enough. I won't knock next time. The inside of the house looked the same as always. Hardwood floors scarred with scratches caused by mishaps in moving furniture that Phil had never bothered to fix. A sagging blue couch that Wilbur was pretty sure was older than him. Picture frames hanging on the wall that were in desperate need of a good dusting. Sometimes Wilbur wondered if this house was stuck in time, given how he could never pinpoint a single thing that had changed about it in the past five years. Kicking off his boots and leaving them by the front door, Wilbur tossed his coat onto the couch and fiddled with the cuffs of his sweater sleeves as he followed Phil towards the kitchen. The smell of garlic and vegetables floated through the air, and Wilbur's mouth watered. You finally learned how to cook? Wilbur asked, remembering how his childhood had been one of microwave meals and fast food dinners. Phil rolled his eyes. Trying to learn. Techno's been teaching me a few things here and there. He thinks I need to be more health conscious. Wilbur snorted. He realizes you're not that old, right? With the way he harasses me about shit like cholesterol, you'd think I'm in my fifties or something. Phil said, huffing a bit. But I figured it's about time I learned how to cook something besides scrambled eggs and toast. So I'm trying to make chicken with broccoli and mashed potatoes tonight. Now in the kitchen, Wilbur could see the chicken baking in the oven, while the broccoli hummed in the microwave. There was a large bowl of fluffy potatoes sitting on one of the counters, and Wilbur raised an eyebrow when he saw potato peels piled high in the trash can. You made mashed potatoes from scratch? Wilbur asked. That's the main thing Techno taught me how to make. Phil snorted, cracking open the oven to check on the chicken. I had to Google a recipe for the chicken, and I just followed the instructions on the bag for the broccoli. Of course. Techno and his love of all potato-themed dishes. Snaking through the narrow space between the counter and the stove, Wilbur darted for the dining table so he wouldn't get in Phil's way. Before he sat down, though, he paused. Is there anything I can help you with? He asked, only having just realized that's probably something he should offer. Phil shook his head. Nah, it's almost done anyway. Nodding. Wilbur sat down in one of the hard wooden chairs at the table. He watched Phil rush around the kitchen, taking two chicken breasts on a metal tray out of the oven and setting them on top of the stove, before popping open the microwave and cursing under his breath as he grabbed the hot bowl with his fingers. Like always, his interactions with Phil were stilted at best. It had been easier when he was still living with Phil. Despite the invisible barrier always existing between them, they both knew how to move around one another, how to dip in and out of conversation without awkward pauses or jolting subject changes. But that had been a learned skill that they were both rusty at now. Wilbur stared at the table, running his fingers over a long scratch in the wood, remembering when he was ten and accidentally made that when he was trying to cut a piece of paper with a knife because he couldn't find scissors. It was a miracle Wilbur hadn't cut a finger off. But the dining table hadn't been so lucky. Was it normal to feel like a stranger in your childhood home? There was no doubt Wilbur knew this place like the back of his hand. He knew every whirl in the wood floors, knew the exact part of the wall that had a slight indent in it from the time he had tripped and nearly knocked his own teeth out, and knew that if you lifted up the couch, you'd find a large brown stain on the rug from an unfortunate incident with a bottle of soy sauce. But was knowing about a place the same thing as it being familiar to you? Wilbur wasn't sure. Sitting at the dining table he'd spent nearly two decades eating at, watching his father struggle to put together the kind of dinner he'd never gotten as a child, he couldn't help but feel like a guest in someone else's home, like he was trying to squeeze himself into a mold he'd long since outgrown. Maybe, as a child, Wilbur had belonged here but adult Wilbur didn't belong here whatsoever. Then again, Wilbur couldn't remember the last time he'd felt like he belonged anywhere. Not in this town. Not in this family. Not in this life. So lost in his thoughts, Wilbur didn't even notice Phil had finished the meal until he was putting a plate right down in front of his face. 
thank you, Wilbur said, blinking himself out of his stupor. You're welcome, Phil replied, going back to make his own plate. A few minutes later, they were both seated at the table and digging into the food. The potatoes were great, which didn't surprise Wilbur, because Techno had taught Phil how to make those. The chicken was a bit dry, and the broccoli was a bit overdone, but it was still leagues better than the few times Phil had tried to cook meals like this when Wilbur was a kid. At least this time, the food was still food, and not blackened char. So, Phil began, swallowing a piece of chicken. How have things been? Techno hadn't told Phil about the beach incident, but he probably wanted Wilbur to tell him on his own. However, that probably wasn't the sort of thing to bring up over dinner, so he decided to hold off on that for now. It's been fine, Wilbur shrugged, taking a bite of broccoli. Just the same old, day in and day out. He swallowed the food, washing it down with a sip of water. What about you? How have I been? Phil asked, raising an eyebrow. Wilbur nodded, and Phil shrugged in a way that eerily reminded Wilbur of himself. Same as you, pretty much. Working, gardening, you know how it is. Gardening. Wilbur glanced out the window into the backyard, barely able to make out the thorny rose bushes in the dying light of the twilight sky. They had been his mother's flowers originally. After she had died, Phil had taught himself how to garden to make sure they never lost their color completely. Silence descended on the table and Wilbur once again longed for the days where they were better at this back-and-forth dance, when they hadn't forgotten the choreography of their conversations to make these awkward bouts of quiet less noticeable. The sound of metal forks clinking against glass plates filled the space between them. Wilbur struggled to think of something else to say. Do you ever feel like something's missing in your life? He finally asked after a few moments the words slipping out from his mind unbidden. Phil blinked and cocked his head to the side as he considered the question, and it reminded Wilbur of the way crows would look at you, trying to analyze you with a mind that was far too intelligent for any normal bird to have. How so? Phil questioned, setting his fork down. Furrowing his brows, Wilbur thought back to the empty spaces in his life that seemed to be smothering him these days. Like, you just feel like you lost something, but you can't figure out what it was. You look at a chair and think there should be something sitting in it. Or you feel like your apartment is too quiet at night, even though you've lived alone for years. Like there's an absence, even though nothing filled that space in the first place. Wilbur explained, eyes dropping to his plate as he spoke. Phil narrowed his eyes, still staring at him with that crow-like gaze. I know the feeling, but I know where the absences came from in my life. Wilbur winced. Of course Phil knew what it was like to be missing something in your life, because he'd had a hole in his heart ever since Wilbur's mother died. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. Wilbur muttered, hair falling over his face as he took another bite of his food. You don't need to apologize. Phil reassured him, finally picking up his fork again to eat. That really just makes me worried about you. Shaking his head, Wilbur speared another piece of broccoli and dipped it into the mashed potatoes, because why the hell not? I'm fine. I've just been in a weird mood the past few days. Pale blonde eyebrows scrunched together. Why? Did something happen? Well, if Wilbur didn't tell him now, then when else would he tell him? Um... Yeah, I guess you could say something happened. Wilbur admitted after a beat, scratching the back of his neck. Phil nodded for him to go on, and Wilbur took a breath to steady himself. So, you know how that dead body was found on the beach a few days ago? Yeah, Techno's been telling me a bit about it. No one can identify him, right? Wilbur nodded. Yeah, they can't. But, uh... I guess I should probably tell you that I'm the one who actually, uh, found the body and called the police. Phil's eyes widened. 
That was you? Yeah, it was. So I guess that, uh, hooked me up a bit. Wilbur said, ducking his head again. A few seconds ticked by in silence as Phil let out a slow breath between his teeth. When Wilbur glanced up at Phil through his curls, he saw his father was staring at him with a pained look. Why didn't you tell me sooner? That must have been horrible to see. Phil whispered. Wilbur winced. I just... I didn't want to worry you. And I'm fine, really. I just saw a dead body. It's not like Techno hasn't seen dozens of those. Yeah, but Techno is a police officer. He's been trained to deal with that kind of stuff. Phil reminded him, his tone softening to something so gentle it reminded Wilbur of the way you spoke to a wounded animal. Fucking hell, Will. Of course you're feeling a bit off. I think anyone would be freaked out after something like that. Groaning, Wilbur dragged his hands down his face. Despite the constant tension humming between him and his father like a live wire, right now, in his foggy state, he couldn't stop the words from rushing out of his mouth like an overflowing faucet. I had this dream a few nights ago. Wilbur started, setting his fork down and twisting his fingers into his hair. I was at the beach, and the dead kid was there too. But he wasn't dead, he was alive, and he was talking to me. He knew my name, and told me he wasn't dead, that the body wasn't him. Then he... Wilbur's breathing hitched as he took another unsteady breath. He asked me to save him. Begged me, even. Wilbur hadn't realized he was crying until he saw a tear drop onto his plate. Phil was already out of his chair, rushing around to the other side of the table and resting his hands on Wilbur's shoulders. I just... everything just feels wrong, Wilbur exclaimed burying his face in his hands as his shoulders shook. Something is fucking wrong, and I can't stop noticing it. It's just the tiniest things, like a playlist I don't remember making, or a sweatshirt that I don't remember buying. And I keep thinking that if I just ignore it, this feeling will eventually go away, but it's driving me fucking nuts. And now on top of it all, I feel like that fucking forest is watching me again, and it's just... it's too much... Phil rubbed Wilbur's shoulders as he dissolved into a puddle of frustrated tears. He hated this. He hated not feeling like himself. He hated feeling like something was missing. He just wanted things to go back to normal. But he wasn't even sure what normal was for him anymore. I feel like I'm mourning someone I never even met. Wilbur then confessed in a whisper. There was a moment of quiet as Phil continued to rub gentle menstruations into Wilbur's shoulder blades, humming softly under his breath as Wilbur's breathing began to slow. It only took a few seconds for Wilbur to realize Phil was humming in the same pattern as his breathing exercises, so Wilbur did his best to follow along, focusing on Phil's voice as he counted the seconds in his head. Once again, in the back of his mind, Wilbur couldn't help but think of how strange this was. He couldn't remember the last time Phil had comforted him when he was crying. It probably had been some time when he was still a teenager, but he couldn't be sure. Eventually, after Wilbur's breathing had calmed down and his tears had dried up, Phil moved his hands away from Wilbur's back, and Wilbur had to bite down the urge to whine at the loss of contact. Maybe that had been the most human contact he could remember having in months, but he wasn't going to tell Phil that. Setting his hands on the table next to Wilbur, Phil leaned down so they were face to face. You said the forest is watching you again? Phil said quietly, and Wilbur almost jumped back, because out of everything he said, he hadn't been expecting Phil to latch onto that. Is it like when you were in high school? Wilbur frowned. Like when I was in high school? Phil nodded. Yeah, don't you remember? You went to the forest one time with your friends at night, because you were all telling each other ghost stories. And for the next few weeks, you wouldn't stop complaining to me about how you felt like the trees were watching you, and it was freaking you out. Wading through the fog in his mind, Wilbur faintly recalled something like that, 
but he didn't remember it being as pronounced as it was now. I... I didn't think it was that bad. It was pretty bad, Phil told him, dragging his chair around from the other side of the table so he could sit next to Wilbur. You had nightmares about the place for nearly a month. His frown deepened. That's weird, I don't remember that. The forest has always been a creepy-ass place, Phil said, resting his hands on the table. You said you found the body on the beach, though, right? It was the part of the shore that's, like, right next to the forest. Wilbur explained, shuddering at the memory. Nodding again, Phil tucked a strand of blonde hair behind his ear. Was the dream you had in the same place as where you found the body? Wilbur nodded, and Phil pursed his lips. Have you had any dreams since that first one? No, I've been taking my anxiety meds to sleep, and I don't dream when I'm sedated like that. There was a beat as Phil considered this, scratching at the stubble on his jaw. While I'd usually be happy that you're using your medication like you're supposed to, I think you might need to not take it for a night or two. Phil started. I know that dream probably freaked you the fuck out, and I don't blame you. But sometimes dreams can be trying to tell you something you can't hear during the day. Wilbur blinked. Uh, what? I know it sounds kind of batshit. Phil said, holding his hands up in mock surrender. But there are a lot of stories about that forest, how it can connect people in unexpected ways. You might not be able to get rid of this weird feeling until you work out whatever it is the dead boy is trying to tell you. Are you saying you think I'm being haunted by a fucking ghost? Wilbur asked, wondering if his dad had truly lost it. I wouldn't rule it out but I think it's more likely that you're just not dealing with the trauma of seeing that dead boy, and your dreams might be trying to confront you about it. Phil explained. Either way, I don't think taking those pills is helping you in any way. But isn't that what I'm supposed to use them for, when I'm dealing with shit that's making me anxious? Wilbur challenged, meeting his dad's eyes again. Yes, it is. But I'm saying maybe just try not to take them for a night or two and see what happens. If it just makes you feel worse, go back to taking them. No harm done, you know? No harm done. Yeah, like having nightmares about a dead kid wasn't going to cause any damage to his mental state in the long run. Great idea, Dad. But Wilbur couldn't deny the logic in his father's argument. Phil was right in pointing out that the pills didn't seem to be helping. Maybe if Wilbur dreamt of the boy again and confronted him? He'd finally be able to get the peace he was so desperate for. Sighing, Wilbur dropped his hands into his lap. Okay, I won't take the pills tonight. Remember, they're still going to be there if you decide it's worse without them. Phil reassured him. For some reason, that thought didn't comfort Will as much as it should have. Following Phil's advice, that night, Wilbur didn't take his medication. Sure enough, he found himself sitting on the beach again. Dawn was still cresting the sky. Pink and orange streaked above him in the sky like brush strokes. And when Wilbur tried to take a breath, the salt in the air stung the back of his throat. He dug his fingers into the sand, feeling how warm it was as it crumpled around his fingertips. The waves reached for him again, the foam just barely brushing the tip of his boot. Wilbur scooted back to avoid it. When he looked up at the water itself, he saw the boy again. His back was to Wilbur. He stared out at the water, knees pulling up to his chest and chin resting on top. Although he couldn't see his face from this angle, Wilbur could feel the sadness radiating off the boy. Like he was missing something so badly, it was a pain he projected out to everyone around him. Hello? Wilbur tried. Immediately, the boy's head whipped around, his gray-blue eyes going wide when they met Wilbur's. Wilbur! The boy cried out, the sadness dissipating away from him like morning fog fading in sunlight. Turning around, he crawled over to Wilbur on his knees, and Wilbur could see his jeans were soaking wet from the salt water. You came back! 
Um, yeah, I did. Wilbur said, not sure if he should mention he didn't choose to dream about this place. The boy's joy and relief faded away when he heard the uncertainty in Wilbur's tone. I thought you weren't going to come back for me. That you were just, you were going to leave me here. A wave of guilt surged through Wilbur, despite the fact that he didn't know this boy. He looked like he was struggling to hold back tears, and Wilbur noticed his eyes were decidedly more bloodshot than they had been the last time he'd had this dream. I'm sorry, Wilbur muttered, wringing his hands in his lap. I just, I got freaked out. The boy frowned at this. Freaked out? Because of me? Wilbur nodded. The boy winced, as if Wilbur had struck him across the face. Why would you be freaked out by me? The boy asked in a small voice. Shit. If he answered honestly, would he offend the kid? It was probably better than lying to him. I mean, if you found a dead body on the beach and suddenly started dreaming about the guy, you'd be freaked out too, right? Wilbur asked unsure of why he felt so embarrassed to admit that. The boy was silent for a moment. Wilbur glanced up at him through the hair falling over his eyes and saw the boy staring at him in shock. Seconds ticked by. The ocean reached for them again, and Wilbur moved his legs up further, while the boy didn't flinch as the water pooled around his legs. Slowly, realization dawned on the boy's face. Do you know who I am, Wilbur? He asked in a whisper so soft, Wilbur struggled to hear it over the ocean. Wilbur shook his head. No, I don't. He said, wondering why the words tasted like dirt in his mouth. The boy's breathing hitched, and Wilbur flinched when he saw a tear roll down the boy's cheek. You forgot me, he whispered sounding so completely broken, it made something ache in Wilbur's own chest. I'm sorry. Wilbur wasn't sure why he was apologizing, but it felt like the right thing to do. More tears fell down the boy's cheeks, but he brought up his damp sweatshirt sleeve to wipe them away. It, it's okay, he said, although the cracks in his voice didn't make his words sound very reassuring. I don't... It's not your fault, I don't think. There was a moment of silence as the boy wiped at his eyes a bit more, dragging his hands down his face before digging his fingers into the sand. Huck. No wonder you looked so freaked out the first time you showed up here. The boy muttered, letting out a weak chuckle. Am I supposed to know who you are? Wilbur asked, his own words nearly swallowed by the quiet roar of the waves. The boy nodded, giving Wilbur a pained smile. You are. But if I tell you who I am, you'll just think it's some fucked up dream, won't you? Wilbur didn't answer, but the boy was right and he knew it. Taking his silence as an answer, the boy took a shaky breath. Shit. Okay, this really complicates things. He rubbed his eyes again and turned so he wasn't looking at Wilbur as if meeting Wilbur's eyes was painful for him. There's a place you can go that might help you, remember? I don't know if it'll work, but it's the only thing I can think of. Somewhere in this place? Wilbur questioned, gesturing to the beach around them. The boy shook his head. Not in the dream. I mean when you wake up. Do you know the train tracks on the edge of town? Wilbur knew the train tracks. They sat right outside the border of the town itself, littered with abandoned freight trains after the line had been shut down when Wilbur was just a kid. No one had ever bothered to take the rails off or collect the rusted over train cars, which had made it a popular party spot for teenagers. I'm familiar with them, yeah. If you go there when you wake up, you'll find a shoebox in the far back corner of one of the freight cars. I need you to go find that shoebox, Wilbur. The boy told him, still not looking at him. It might help, it might not, but it's the only thing I can think of. Wilbur opened his mouth to ask why the boy couldn't just tell him what was going on, but before he could, 
another wave came much stronger than the others. Yelping, Wilbur scrambled back on the sand, while the lower half of the boy's body was engulfed by the water. The last thing Wilbur saw before he woke up was the boy giving him one of the saddest smiles he'd ever seen.